Hello, and welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Network podcast, where everyone belongs, especially if you think you don't. Welcome, imposters. My name is Chris Grundeman, and I'm here with my extremely amazing co-host, who is not a mouse, Zoe Rose. <laughs> not a mouse. It is episode 42, and this is the Peter Jones episode, and it is going to be great. Peter has reached that rarefied position in the world of technology that we call the Distinguished Engineer. He's a Distinguished Engineer at Cisco. He's also a chair of the Ethernet Alliance and works in the IEEE 802.3, aka Ethernet Working Group. Hey, Peter, would you mind introducing yourself a bit further to the Imposter Syndrome Network? Sure, Chris, thank you. Now, I will make the point that 42, while being the answer, the hard part was figuring out the question, which is where you need the mice to start Earth as the computing planet. I'm so confused. And if you remember, one of the mice was actually named Benji. Benji. All right, so having finished nerding out on Douglas Adams, so I, as you said, I'm Peter Jones. I work for Cisco. I've been with Cisco for 17 years, which is by far my longest job. So I'm still finding fun things to do. So from the accent, you can tell I'm not really an American local. I've been in the States for 22 years. I originally come from the West Coast of Australia. For those who don't know the geography, Australia is the size of the US with 25 million people. I'm in the western third of the country, two and a half million people, one million, two million in one city. So there are more people in Shanghai than are in Australia. So we're sort of few and far between. I went to university planning to do a physics degree because my dad did physics and I thought physics was awesome because it just made sense. You only need to know two or three things and the rest you could work out. And I'm actually one of the people who really like quantum mechanics. So I'm one of those people. However, when I got to university and in Australia, bachelor's of science are three years. And so there's none of this general education stuff. You know, my, fir- my first year was physics, maths, computer science and chemistry, then physics, maths, computer science, and then physics, computer science. But I figured out the people who were going to get the good jobs were the one who, ones who were getting like 80, you know, 90%. The rest of us were going to teach. So this is a while ago. So I was actually in university in 81, which is before most a lot of people were born. I looked around and said, this computer stuff looks interesting. Maybe I can make a business out of that. Excellent. Well, we're going to dive into the rest of that story through the rest of this podcast. But I want to start, well, I mentioned Ethernet a lot in my introduction, and also the Ethernet Alliance, the IEEE, uh, and I know you've also worked with the NBASE-T Alliance. So maybe without getting too, too technical, what I'd like to understand is, is basically two things. First, what is it like to work within and across these standards bodies? And second, how do you even get started doing something like that? Maybe it's worth even backing up a little bit and describing what a standards body is, and then dive into your work with them and, and how you got there and, and that kind of thing. Sure. So there's, there's sort of two sides. There's what's called SDOs, Standards Development Organizations. So that includes things like IEEE, the ITU, TAA, ISO IEC. And they tend to be very formal bodies. There'll be sets of representation rules. For instance, the ITU is country-based. IEEE 802 is individual-based. And so that's where the standards are written. Then there's organizations that sort of go beside them which are often how to promote the standards or maybe how to conform, how to form consensus ahead of them. So one thing about SDOs is they're often a bad, very bad place to develop new technology because the structures slow you down. So the Ethernet Alliance, which sort of sits beside logically the 3 is really a marketing group. What we try and do is explain Ethernet to the outside world. We do some work where we try and make sure when it comes out, it works first time. So for instance, we'll run plug fests behind closed doors. We get all the engineers from companies together and sit them in a room and say, make this work. Right? As you can imagine, that requires an NDA because stuff doesn't work first time. And then once it starts to work, we go out and show it off. So I was at the OSD show, um, not last week, but the week before. And there's a table there, which has from the OAF, the Optical Internet Working Forum, Action Forum. So they had a whole lot of very cool stuff that was all bare boards, right? With fans running over it. You could see all the boards open. And that's what I would describe as the just about works. The Ethernet Alliance had a whole rack of new stuff, which is just about, just about almost always works. So there's this thing from technology development to really technology consumability. And so I'm interested in the bit where technology becomes consumable, right? So there's a bunch of people in Silicon Valley who still want to build Ferraris and Formula One cars or maybe castles in the sky. You know, I'm sort of more the cameras and Corollas guy, right? How can you build stuff that everyone can just use? So that's what SDOs do. SDOs write, write specs. Added to three is an interoperability spec. What we do is we define the behavior you can see outside 
to make sure they work together. We don't really define what you do in the middle. And sometimes people get confused. It's like, oh, this is how you build a Mac. This is the behavior you have to see outside. Because our job is interoperability, right? How can two or three people build something that talks to each other? Yeah, it makes sense. And that's a lot of, I think, a lot of standards are actually interoperability specs, right? Because we don't necessarily care what you're doing in your little box. We care how your box connects to the boxes next to it, right? I mean, that's what really matters a lot of times, at least in networking. To a large extent, yes, that's what they tend to be. There are, I mean, I think there are some of the others, but most of the networking ones are, here's how you talk to each other. I don't really care exactly how you run XSX algorithm inside it, but the result has to be this. So how did you get involved in working in these standards bodies? And, and, and then what does that work look like when you're actually there day to day or, or week to week or however often you're getting together and doing that? So, so this actually goes back to my, so maybe I'll quickly run through the career path and then sort of figure some of this out because what you do in Australia is very different to what you can do in the States. So as I said, I did a degree, a science degree. I finished that degree, you know, I finished my exams. And it's like spent a couple of weeks sleeping and like maybe I should go find a job. I looked around and I got a couple of job offers. Some of them were writing like payroll systems for banks. And I was like, this is really boring. And I got offered a job that was for a big mining company and involved spending a year up working up in the mine site. And I thought, well, that, take, that sounds more interesting. With the help of my brother-in-law as a mechanic, I bought myself a car and then put all my stuff in it and we, I drove. It's about 24 hours drive. Um, so I stopped halfway. And then as I'm going further up the coast, I'm basically going up the coast road in Australia and there's a, there's one truck stop roadhouse before you take, turn off the paved road to go on the dirt road. And this is the middle of summer and I'm there and my car won't start. So it's like, okay. So they pull out this huge rack, rack, um, set of batteries and we get it going again and they say, just don't stop. So then I have another couple hundred kilometers in dirt to do. Of course, halfway through that, I get a flat tire. I have to actually change the flat tire while the car is running in the middle of summer. So. I guess, and that was, that was again on a, a mine site. And so it's not a traditional technology place. So you have to get issued hard hat, you, you, you're in boots. And so some of my background is very different to your average IT person. I didn't come out of college and go into a nice air, air conditioned office. And so amongst other things I had to do was, because it was a unionized mine site, I had to sort of figure out an understanding with the electricians union to where I could carry tools and I wouldn't go out and strike. So I think... Almost from the start of my career, I've been used to talking to people who aren't like me. So I was there for a couple of years. I moved to a company which was sort of like the Gap. I was writing point of sale terminal code. And this was relatively early because they had a non a non DOS compatible PC with a nice color screen and a keyboard, cache register, twin floppy drives, right? One with the program, one with the data, uh, cache register and motor. And so we were running, it was like coming up the Gap and we were doing all the point of sale stuff. One stage, this got me into. I had to talk a sales man, a store manager through doing a, a lock edit on a floppy disk to recover her files because otherwise she couldn't transmit numbers. So this produces, you know, again the ability to talk to various people. Did that for a while, then I moved into Datacoms. That was a company called Computer Protocol, then became Datacraft, and that was any protocol to any other protocol. It did some software maintenance. Then I spent a year in the states doing pre and post sales support. Then I went back and became a developer. So that ran for another couple of years, became a development manager, rinse and repeat, go to, another, go to a university research group, spun a company out of that, end up in America in 2001. I worked for a startup, be there for the life of its, of its peak until it fell out and then moved to Cisco. So there's this very long swath which really starts getting interesting about the time I get to software for embedded systems. So in that time, I've done a whole lot of different roles, but they've all sort of been, they go more and more embedded and embedded could go anywhere from rich to bashing to writing network management code. So when I moved to this startup that was in the US, this is 2002-ish, all of the people are basically, we're all trying to do a new standard because all the startups want to have the name on a standard. So I got sent to IEEE to do a new standard that was called Added to 17, Brazilian Packet Rings. This turned out to be a great standard, which died, as many great standards do. But this is where I started to learn about what was required to work in this type of environment. It's interesting, though, because you do mention you have a non-typical career path or maybe slightly varied direction into your career. And also, you didn't obviously go to school for computer science in the beginning, although I think you might have ended up getting one. 
Yes, yeah, that, that was the, the first year realisation that the good physics jobs were going to the people who got 95%, not the rest of us at 75. <laughs> and this computing thing looked like a cool plan. Ds get degrees. I'm just saying. <laughs> but no, that's a good point. But, but is there a time that you kind of felt like, you know, you're working, as you said, you work with a variety of different people. You've had a very slightly, a very slightly, um, <laughs> a slightly different career journey. And also kind of experience with people that aren't super happy with you sometimes. So is there ever a time where you felt like oh, you're not smart enough or you don't have the right knowledge base? And how do you get further from there? Well, yes. I mean, the simple answer is you, is you talk to it. Okay. I think the simple answer is there's, you know, I've seen this, there's a bunch of people and they sort of go into the people who are absolutely confident with themselves and those who aren't. And you can never tell from the outside which one they are. So I guess the first time this really came up for me was when I accepted a job to go from having done a year of software maintenance for this company. And they said, look, we need someone to go to America to be a pre-power star support engineer. It's like, okay, that sounds like fun. So I went home to my girlfriend of about four months and said, hey, we're sending me to America for you. You want to come? Yeah. So this stage, I'm being sent over to pre and post sales support for a networking company. And so I don't know that much about networking. So on the way across on the plane, which is, and this is a while ago, so this is mid-89, I read Tenenbaum's book on networking. And, and that's, that's where I got, okay, so now I understand a lot more about how the stuff works. I found that really helpful. You know, there's, there's a bunch of cases where you go, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And some of this, I think, becomes mentors, right? Who can I ask? A whole bunch of them I think you never actually get over, right? Because... I mean, I still get the stage, of, I might have told you, Zoe, that when I get up on stage and speak at Cisco Live, I'm terrified before I go up there. And so the, there's always the problem of there is what your the thinking part of your brain knows and what the emotional part knows, and they're often very different. If it's a thinking part of your brain that says, I don't know enough, you can do something about it. It's the emotional side that's hard. No, definitely. I would like to note that it's interesting to me that you say you're still terrified every time you speak. I actually had that noted in my notes to mention because the thing that's interesting is you're a distinguished speaker times two, which is basically saying not only are you a good speaker, but you're impressive to you know the audience. They're well impressed with the way that you speak and present your topics. And the, one of the things that you mentioned to me when we were chasing ducks and geese with my daughter was you'd mentioned that actually the trick is talking about what you truly believe in. Do you have some more insights there as to maybe somebody starting out in their public speaking or somebody that wants to enhance their public speaking? What, what do you mean by truly believing in the topic that you're presenting? Because sometimes you're presenting very technical, sometimes you're presenting procedures. I don't know. <laughs> so the question is, how do you deal with it when you are scared and how do you get over that? So when I got into this business, I'd sort of gone back and I started a little on my IEEE work. At the same time, I'd started running this alliance called the Ambassador Alliance. And so I got some press training out of that because I was going to have to do some public interest stuff. What really made the difference was a friend of mine, a guy called Dave Sachs, who is now my, he's my normal co-speaker and is now 20 times distinguished. He saw a presentation I gave inside Cisco about you know what was happening with Ethernet, where things were moving. He said, that would be a great presentation you should do for Cisco Live. So I've been going to Cisco Life for a little while as part of a sort of exposure experiment. And I said, yeah, I'm not sure I could do that. I think it'd be interesting. And he said, look, what about if we do it together? I'm like, fine, okay. I got seduced into this partly because I thought the story we had was really interesting. I thought it would be a good plan to tell. I just didn't know how to tell it at Cisco Life. So I worked with Dave. And we put a story together and we presented it. And I think the first time was San Diego. I don't remember which year, maybe 2015. We actually got the best score for a new session this stage, I'm sort of astounded, right, that some, someone's come to listen to me talk about this stuff. And particularly Cisco Live is often very technical sessions, and my sessions tend to all be about context. Even technically, they're about stuff you don't actually have to know that helps you understand what's around you. And so the question was, is how do you deal with that? And so I think, so when you go to training for Cisco Live, they give you a whole lot of good tips, like, for instance, how do you transition from side to side in the hall? You look at one person at once. And then they say you should practice, practice, practice. I tried that and I failed. I just cannot do it right. The whole thing about speaking to yourself in a mirror just doesn't work for me. Although I know, I know people who do it and get very good scores, I just can't do it. But one of my other mentors said, 
what you need to do is have your first five minutes solid and know the material, right? Once you have that, you can go through it. It's going to work. It'll be different every time, but that's fine. You also said when you're getting ready to talk, right, meet three or four people as, you, as they're coming in. What you want is to have three or four people in the room. You can hook your story to theirs. So, for instance, in this case, if I'm talking about something, I'd say, well, you know, so Zoe is the security manager for, for Canon. Right? Canon is a very large company, so they're going to face this problem. And so hooking someone in a, into that story makes a huge difference because it makes it real to people, right? They can see themselves there. And apart from that, I think you just have to, you have to understand the view from the inside and the view from the outside are different, right? This is, this is like the waterfowl. If you're a duck, right, you're paddling like mad underneath, but you look very serene on top. I liked that point about uh, the ducks mainly because my daughter loves ducks, so I've chased many ducks and fed many. See, see, what you want to do is hook your story into the person you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you did it very well. But um, that does bring me to what are the points that you made about, actually, previously in a conversation I had about you. About me or with me, just checking. Right? <laughs> it was with you, it wasn't in my head. Um, pre- um, you know, you're talking in your head about yourself. <laughs> I mean, that also happens, but in this context, it was actually you. Um, but it was uh, being harsh on yourself because you know the internal, you know what's happening externally, but you also know what's happening internally in your mind, whereas other people only see the external view. Which is where I would say the inside view doesn't look like the outside view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about your thoughts of how to get over that concern, because obviously you've had a very impressive career. You're not only a distinguished engineer, you're also a distinguished speaker. I mean, my daughter was very impressed with you. I'm a legend in my own lunchtime. Yeah, there we go. So from somebody that, like me, that has not the greatest confidence in herself. I would love to hear your thoughts on how to not be so rubbish at it. You mean not be so rubbish in believing in yourself? Yeah. And, and the way <laughs> you describe it, of course, sets the question. So I think there's a couple of things. You you need some people who you can talk to and you can decide that you'll believe them over you, right? Because there's the there's the thinking part and there's the monkey brain part. And you've got to at some stage get at peace with the fact that your view isn't right. I'm sure we all know some people with on the autistic spectrum scale, right, Asperger. You know, Asperger's is reverse inherited. You diagnose the kid, then the parents, then the grandparents. It's like, oh, that explains this. Yes, that does make sense. So one of my one of my kids has this. And when he was doing social training, they have a concept called mind blind, which is the inability to believe, understand someone else's mind is not like yours. This is where you see Aspies in the playground, they get really upset because they have one idea of the playground rules, and if anyone else is not doing them, they're clearly cheating. <laughs> Which on playgrounds, where you know things change all the time, that doesn't work. I'm just laughing because you've clearly defined me right there. <laughs> yeah. And so I think what you have to say is, okay, I have a view of myself, but I know I'm looking from the inside of the house. I know what the outside looks like is going to be different. Who can I talk to who can tell me what they see that I trust? I mean, so scores is one way, right? Like Cisco Live with the scoring, that's one way of doing it. It can be a somewhat brutal way, but ultimately you need people you can trust who say, hey, that worked out, or we'll tell you when it, when it didn't. Um, I don't think there's any way to ever stop worrying about it, not that I've found. No, but that's a really good point is the getting somebody that you trust because I can get feedback from people, but if I don't think that they have my best intentions at heart, it's really hard to take their honest feedback. And I am a little bit sensitive. Well, on this topic, right? So being a new recent parent, you've undoubtedly run into the fact everyone will give you parenting advice. Everyone. Oh, bloody hell. Yes. And what you do with all of it <laughs> is you say thank you, and then most of it you throw away, right? The stuff that feels good you try, and then you throw some of it away anyway. And, ju- and just to check on this topic, right? When you took your baby home, did you feel like you absolutely had all organised and exactly what you were going to do? Or, or were you the, how the hell can I be a mum? I can't know. My daughter was like, super tiny i was so scared i was gonna break her like bloody hell she was like a doll and, and everyone focuses on the okay pregnant, pregnant birth and like oh after just be, be just be a mum you're like holy shit how do i do this <laughs> true i've run into people who are absolutely confident they know exactly what they're going to do i mean i think probably elon musk is one of those i mean i don't know if you've read the biography of steve jobs i think he was as well and i don't think i'd like to be around those people i don't think there's any way to actually stop it you can't be cured what you can do is work with people that you trust you can manage to deal with it just on that point because well one thing you mentioned zoe was you know that you want to take feedback from someone who has your best interest at heart and i was going to challenge that a little bit 
because you know I think that there are definitely people who have said things to me intentionally to hurt me that were true, which is why they were going to hurt me, which I needed to hear. I said trust. And so he said best interest. Best interest <laughs> doesn't mean being nice to you all the time. <laughs> That's true. Fair. Right, so, for instance, if I'm mentoring something, my best interests aren't to tell them they're the best people in the world and everything will be perfect. It's to try and provide. I mean, this is where the constructive criticism comes. So you need to trust people. And people you trust will actually tell you when something's going wrong. If someone is just nice to you all the time, that's a bit suspicious. It is. It is suspicious. I wanted to talk briefly about potentially one of your biggest achievements in your career. I've, I, I read your, uh, well, I spoke to you about it previously, but also I read your the We Are Cisco profile. And I think it was very clear because one of the most well-known, I would say, probably, maybe I'm wrong, it would be the Catalyst oh, 900 series or 9000 series. I don't want to offend anybody. Um, and you played a key part in the development of that. And so I'm curious on your kind of mindset there of, oh my goodness, we have to build a solution. You being asked to create something that hasn't been done before, how do you go about doing it? And also how that fuels emotionally as well. I think you've just overrun the chat GPT uh, memory bank size. A little bit. <laughs> so I'd been at this startup company, it was called Luminous Networks, and they'd done fairly well, but not well enough to succeed. And so I bailed out like at the end of 2005, like a week and a half before they closed their doors. I went to Cisco because I was sick of building stuff that disappeared. And the problem with a lot of venture startup companies, you build stuff that disappears, you build it disappears. And I found that really frustrating. Right? I want to build stuff that actually got used. So I ended up in the group of Cisco that made Catalyst 2K and 3K, in which you, as you know, was the, um, the cameras and crawlers of networking. And coming into Cisco was sort of odd. It was the biggest company I'd ever worked for, a uh, biggest tech company, and they had a very strong culture, and I had to sort of figure out where I was in that. So I spent six months sort of futzing around doing some things, and they said, look, can you go and work on this program? Like it's called the Next Gen Wiring Closet because everything is always the next gen. It's like, okay. So at this stage, what I can bring is I have a bunch of outside experience. I mean, I had run a Cisco network. I'd been building networking for a while, but I really didn't know very much about how Cisco did its business. And so I end up, I'm one of the two senior leads on the, tech, on the software side. So the first thing I get told to do is like, go throw together a software architecture for this. Okay, what are we trying to achieve? And so that's safety basically put together an architecture which looked much more like a virtual chassis than it had done before, because we wanted to make it seem like it could be consumable. And at that stage, Cisco had the Catalyst 2K, 3K, right, the 4K and the 6K, and they're all very different, different chipsets, different flavors of the OS, and it was really frustrating for customers, right? Because there isn't one person, one, there isn't one customer who only has one thing. So I sort of had to haul that together by finding a bunch of people and getting them to write things for me. At this stage, I got a name as a meeting nuts inside Cisco. So it's often technology, particularly in America, their meeting culture is horrible, right? So everyone wants to drive the meeting. And so I would have a, an agenda, I'd run the meeting, and if you wanted to go and have a different meeting, you could go do that somewhere else yourself. So that took a while for people to adopt. But then, so if we're a bit further along, and I'm having a conversation with the director lead and my, you know, my co-software lead about what we should do next. And this shows you sort of split it. So um, I went really more towards the ASIC side, and my peer went more towards the the feature software side because it'd been a Cisco forever. So at this stage, I basically get handed an architecture spec for a chip. It says go review it. It's like okay, let me start with this. And I started reading. I think the architecture spec was probably 500 pages, maybe. And then we got out with a a full external reference spec, which was 1,500 pages of text and like 13,000 of registers and memories. And so during this period, it's just sort of incrementally working through with people like, what is it you're trying to achieve? What do you want to do? In this case, having the physics minor was really handy because it meant I could speak to the ASIC designers much more easily. One of the things I got involved with was defining the stack protocols. So the, the Catalyst 2K, 3K, slash 9300 are all a stacking system. They're all basically a ring. Now I've built ring protocols before, so that was like, oh, I know how to build one of these. I think it's, it's actually a little bit like boiling the frog, right? You just sort of start piece at a time. So it was like, okay, so I had to do a couple of things. I was the person charged with running the review process of this chip design for um, the software side, which meant putting together and running all things. I probably read the document 10 times myself. I also got involved in really specifying what piece of the chip should do and how they should do it. And lots of times you have to learn stuff you've never learned before. So I didn't really know how they would build a buffering system. I sort of knew how it would work in software, but in hardware, it's entirely different. How we build the parser. So 
I've been involved to some level, but this was a whole new level. And a lot of it, I think, is being willing to learn from other people, right? Showing up and don't, you don't say, look, I know what to do. It's like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. How would you see this working? Uh, what do I not understand, right? What problems you have? So I think you can always be really useful by going in and trying to help as opposed to going in and trying to drive. You need to be really careful with that because if you try and drive without skill or knowledge, it's hard. I think you can. I think management skill is transferable, but you have to trust the people underneath you. So, you know, the starting point was trying to, uh, you know, inherit and understand like 10, 15 years worth of history and try and apply it. Now, that was a very long program. So I started in 2006. We got our first chip back in 2011. We shipped product in 2013. Yeah, that's a very long development cycle. But that became the best selling switch in the world which is a very cool thing. Now, let, let me ignore the web scalers for the time being because, I mean, they come in at some stage. The place I was interested in was the enterprise networking. So introduced in 2013, I got involved in teaching the field and then teaching customers about how to use this stuff. Basically went along with the times I was going back to standards. So I, I moved from being quite internally focused to being quite outside focused. And, at, you know, at all times the question was, what can we build that can be exposed and be consumed? And so the... I think the key thing we actually did differently was we said, look, you know, we could make it faster, we could make it cheaper, and we said, no, we'll make it flexible. And I think the thing to think about here is that in the enterprise network, right, you only update things every, you know, we'd still like to say five years, but well, it's more like seven to eight. So if you put something in for eight years, I think back seven years, how much change happened? I think four to eight. So the real goal was to create something that could actually change to match what people needed. And that, I think, was the key thing we did that made it such a success. Because that then became, that's the fundamentals for the all the Catalyst 9K family today. That's where, I mean, that's my proudest thing because this is the Cambridge and Corolla's of networking. So I can honestly say that, you know, we have uh, more than half the market. It's been a few years. So my stuff is actually helping people work around the world. So for me, this is, this is a way cool thing, right? You can't get this anywhere else. It, do, it really doesn't get much cooler than that. I mean, to, to work on a project like that and have such a, such a driving force in that project. I, mean, I don't get a share of the money. Fair. Right? <laughs> that would be a different thing. That would be even better. That's the, that's the cherries on top, I guess, right? But, you know, we were, we were lucky to sort of be there at the time where we got the trust and the management. And we got to achieve something I think was, was really awesome, right? We got to build flexibility into systems so people could actually add value to the networks after they bought it. Right. So the big thing for us became fabrics, that's SDA, et cetera. That's all VXLAN. VXLAN didn't exist when we, when we designed the chip. So have we been able to consume all the flexibility? No, but the fundamental idea of being able to build something that can change with the business is way cool. It is. It is. Well, time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. But this podcast is not. Uh, and the time has come to wind this episode down. Peter, thank you. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to bring you back. Where's part two? We definitely didn't ask you anything about what it's like to be a distinguished engineer, although I think some of the standards work does copy there, but, but we definitely have some more to talk about, as is often the case. Thank you for sharing as much of your story with us as you have today. The Imposter Syndrome Network is very happy to have uh, heard this, I am sure. Thank you also for being here on episode 42, a special one for me anyway. And, uh, and thank you to all our listeners for your time and your attention. Uh, our goal is to help as many folks as we can. And so we'd really appreciate it if you share this episode and this podcast with others who might be interested. Now, now, Peter, there is one more topic we didn't get to that I want to touch on before we turn off the mics. Where is my only imposter sticker? Yeah. Okay. We can get you a sticker. That's coming. Send an address. We'll get you. What I want to ask, though, before we, before we shut off the mics here is for your perspective on, on mentorship and particularly the mentor mentee roles and responsibilities, I guess, can you, can you define kind of what, you know, maybe quickly, you know, how, how to be a good mentee, how to be a good mentor, how, how should they work together? Obviously that's a big question, but maybe just, you know, the bullet points of, you know, what you think. So I actually, I, I covered this in, in a recent presentation and maybe you guys can link to it. And I have a slide in there, which basically talks about why I do this thing. It's both a professional and moral responsibility. You want to leave the world better than you came into it. And so you sort of look around and you go, okay, who's missing and who can I help? Now, the trick with being a mentor is you get into a conversation, you have no idea what you're, what you're going to say because you don't know where it's going and you don't go in knowing all the answers. So I think being a good mentor is actually about listening and good questions. I think being a good mentor 
you need relation, trust in that relationship, which is a mentor you almost have to offer first. But ultimately, it's, I think on both sides, it's being open to telling people and listening. Now, as, as a mentor, right, often I'm not the person people need to speak, so I go find someone for them. But, you know, as a mentee, it's the same thing. You want to find people who gel with you and you have to have a trust relationship. All right, without trust, nothing works. Now, my mentees are scattered over a bunch of different types of functions, over a bunch of different places in the world and a bunch of different ethnicities and languages. So I tend to look for people who don't look like me. Excellent. We will definitely link to that presentation along with several other things down in the show notes. So if you're listening, check out the show notes. There's going to be some good stuff there. And we will be back next week. This is going to be episode 42 of the Imposter Syndrome Ooh. Network. Oh, oh. Which I think is pretty cool. The answer to life, the universe, and everything. Yes. So I may try to word some of my questions as Douglas Adams quotes. I'm going to be so bad at this because I don't have any. But we'll see if I can work it in. I don't know if I can work it in or not. Well, what you want to do is you want to mention episode 42. Yes. Then as you come out of it, you're going to ask me what's the question. Yes. There you go.